Welcome to Crime, Corruption, and Cocktails, the true crime podcast where we look at cases of corruption and negligence and examine their historical and cultural implications. Today, I'm drinking a fuzzy navel. What do you have, Del? I am drinking a peach daiquiri, and in this week's episode, we will be talking about Monica Witt and her path into espionage and treason. Witt's descent into radicalism was a classic example of a person turning their back on their home country. Monica Witt was born on April 8, 1979 in El Paso, Texas. Her mother died around the time she joined the military, and she became increasingly distant from the rest of her family. Witt joined the United States Air Force in 1997. She was given secret and top-secret clearance as a part of her Air Force service, including, quote, national defense information relating to the foreign intelligence and counterintelligence of the United States, including human intelligence containing the true names of intelligent sources and clandestine agents of the United States intelligence community, end quote. In February 1998, she was assigned to the Defense Language Institute to learn the Persian language and concluded that training in April of 1999. From May 1999 to November 2003, Witt was deployed on classified missions to gather intelligence on U.S. enemies. During the early days of the Iraq War, Staff Sergeant Witt was an airborne cryptologist language analyst deployed to the 95th Reconnaissance Squadron stationed at Crete Naval Base. When war broke out on March 20th, 2003, the following three weeks saw sustained major combat operations. For this service, Witt was awarded the Air Medal by U.S. President George W. Bush and began her assignment as an Air Force Office of Special Investigations, OSI, Special Agent, focusing on criminal investigation and counterintelligence. Witt was transferred to Andrews Air Force Base on Offutt Air Force Base in November 2003. Witt continued deploying, conducting classified operations in the Middle East, and had access to a special access program, SAP, quote, housing classified information, including details on ongoing counterintelligence operations, true names of sources, and the identities of U.S. agents involved in the recruitment of those sources, end quote. Witt retained access to the SAP, acting as its OSI desk officer, even after her enlistment ended in August of 2010. Throughout her service with the U.S. military, Witt deployed to Saudi Arabia, Diego Garcia, Greece, Iraq, and Qatar. Witt separated as a technical sergeant in March of 2008. For the rest of 2008, Witt worked in Maryland for Boys Allen Hamilton as a defense contractor, quote, consulting on Iranian subject matter and providing language and cultural specialization, end quote. Upon leaving the employ of the U.S. intelligence community entities in August of 2010, Witt lost her top secret and SCI security clearance. Until May of 2011, she worked for the nonprofit Amid East, submitting, quote, applications for 40 Iraq Fulbright program candidates to multiple U.S. universities, end quote. In 2012, she published two articles in George Washington University's International Affairs Review. Press TV also published an article by Witt in which she accused the United States Armed Forces of having, quote, a prevailing culture of tolerance for sexual harassment, end quote. At George Washington University, GWU, Witt's classmates described her as withdrawn and quiet, though when she spoke about her military service, she described, quote, drone strikes, extrajudicial killings and atrocities against children, all of which her colleagues in the military would brag about. She seemed distressed by what she called, quote unquote, gross incompetence by her superiors during her time abroad, end quote. 
Witt traveled to Iran in February 2012 to attend an international conference on Hollywoodism that condemned the morality of the United States, promoted anti-Americanism, included an anti-Western sentiment, and, quote, propagated anti-Semitism and conspiracy theories, including Holocaust denial, end quote. In a 2013 interview with the International Quran News Agency, Witt described herself as a non-practicing Christian as of her U.S. military enlistment. She said that it was a mission to Iraq and a desire to understand Iraqis that prompted her to study the Quran. Witt described her enthusiasm for the Islamic holy book, saying it, quote, impressed me so much that I would never have imagined I became so interested in the Quran that I studied it every night, end quote. Witt described her friends, family, and the U.S. military as influenced by, quote-unquote, extensive anti-Iranian and anti-Islamic propaganda in the U.S. and unaccepting of her religious turn. The United States Department of Justice, the DOJ, alleged that Witt appeared on television in Iran and converted to Islam there. While in Iran, Witt was voluntarily video recorded identifying as a U.S. military veteran and making statements critical of the federal government of the United States. These statements and her conversion to Islam were broadcast on Iranian television that same month. Upon her graduation from GWU, the Federal Bureau of Investigation warned Witt that she was a target of Iranian intelligence recruiting. Witt assured U.S. authorities she would not give sensitive information to Iran. Within a month, Witt was hired by American-Iranian journalist and television presenter Marzai Hashemi, quote, in connection with the filming of an anti-American propaganda film that was later aired in Iran, end quote. From June 2012 through August 2013, Witt was regularly communicating with an Iranian-American. This individual held dual citizenship and acted in ways consistent with being an Iranian intelligence operative. The New York Times identified this person as Marzai Hashimi. In her communiques with Hashimi, Witt suggested she might leak intelligence data to the media, including statements such as, quote, if all else fails, I just may go public with a program and do like Snowden, and quote, I just hope I have better luck with Russia at this point. I think I can slip into Russia quietly if they help me, and then I can contact WikiLeaks from there without disclosing my location, end quote. Witt attended another Hollywoodism conference at the Parisian Azadi Hotel in February 2013. While in Tehran, Witt spoke with Kevin Barnett saying, quote, she had been involved in horrific war crimes with the Air Force and she felt really bad about it, end quote. Witt also participated in more similar anti-American videos as before. Beginning in July of 2013, Witt repeatedly searched Facebook for former counterintelligence co-workers, including intelligence operatives who worked with Witt's previous special access program and the spouses of another. On August 25, 2013, Witt emailed Hashimi with evidence of her good faith, genuineness, qualifications, and or achievements, as well as a quote-unquote conversion narrative, a chronological work history, and with DD Form 214. This form showed that Witt was discharged from military service. Nine minutes later, Hashimi forwarded the email to, quote, an email address associated with Iran, end quote. On August 28, 2013, Witt boarded a flight from Dubai to Tehran, stating, quote, I'm signing off and heading out, end quote. Witt had officially defected to Iran. Witt's U.S. friends last heard from her in the summer of 2013 when she was in Afghanistan or Tajikistan, teaching English as a second or foreign language. They reported her missing after several months of non-communication. Prior to the unsealing of the indictment against her, Witt was the subject of a Federal Bureau of Investigation, or FBI, missing persons case. As a part of their appeal to the public, the FBI announced that Witt had previously traveled to the United Arab Emirates in Iran. On July 9, 2018, 
a grand jury was convened in the United States District Court for the District of Columbia to evaluate eight counts of Title 18 charges brought against Witt and four others. This sealed indictment was released on February 13, 2019, detailing the charges of espionage, fraud, and aiding and abetting. In April 2019, Hashimi denied having a hand in recruiting Witt. Immediately upon her arrival in Iran, Witt was furnished with, quote, housing and computer equipment in order to facilitate her work on behalf of the government of Iran, end quote. She promptly told officials the code name and mission of the United States Department of Defense Special Access Program, to which she previously had access, classified U.S. intelligence operations against a specific target. From January 2014, To May 2015, Witt used fraudulent Facebook accounts to investigate intelligence personnel and prepare quote-unquote target packages for Iran to use and attempt recruitment. Witt also gave Iran the classified true name and counterintelligence activities of the U.S. intelligence community operative. These disclosures were categorized by the FBI's Executive Assistant Director for National Security as having the potential to, quote, cause serious damage to the United States national security apparatus, end quote. Witt is also alleged to have been involved in the questioning of 10 United States Navy sailors captured in the 2016 U.S.-Iran naval incident. By 2021, some Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, officials believe Witt had exposed their informants and disrupted their intelligence gathering in Iran. Witt remains a fugitive and the U.S. government believes she still resides in Iran. Jenny, what are your thoughts on Monica Witt and her defection to Iran? This is a story I have never heard before, and I think it's kind of an extreme case of just being disgusted by your job and maybe being a little vulnerable and then getting radicalized, I would say, because of that. We're all disgusted by our jobs and our coworkers, and again, this is just an extreme case for Monica as she... Seems like she was fed up with the military, you know, saying that they were creating atrocities against children and creating an environment of sexual harassment and assault. I think she said one or the other. And I think, too, she was just curious to learn about the people that she felt that the military was victimizing and got recruited. And she went in too far. I think really shocking to hear. And it's especially shocking to see that she went a step further and did become a spy and shared sensitive information that put people in danger. And it's very unacceptable. What do you think? I definitely agree with you. This is definitely a very extreme case of someone just betraying everything that they once believed in and really damaging other people's lives. Like you said, putting other people in harm's way as a way to get back at the federal government. And that's all without considering the fact that just like her, it's not their fault. They are doing their jobs, they're doing it to the best of their abilities, and the fact that they were, one, unable to continue their work, and basically had another nation state spying on them and targeting them, is definitely not something that you would want. I definitely understand her criticisms of the military. We've talked about the deficiencies of the U.S. military, especially when it comes to sexual assault and sexual harassment. But for me, the way she handled it was wrong. Like, I think she should have left the military. I think she could have worked in advocacy against the military and its practices, But to go and defect to another country and provide them with national security secrets that were entrusted to you, it's a wild story. I also hadn't heard about this case before I started writing it. But after hearing this, it's definitely interesting to see, like, and we're going to talk about this a little later, just the different motivations that go into someone defecting or basically becoming a turncoat against their own country. 
That is a really good point about how she could have, she didn't need to go as far as she did. She could have easily left the military and went on about her life and shared her story to talk about the dangers of the military and the fact that there are mass casualties, the fact that children are brutalized. You can talk about stuff like that. And maybe she didn't feel like people would listen. Maybe she thought that the military would try to keep her quiet somehow, because again, that is something we've sort of talked about. And especially in the United States, I do support our troops, but there is a lot of darkness within, I guess, the hierarchy of the military and just the culture of the United States military as well. So her, I would like to I don't know. I'd like to know a little bit more about her mindset and what did drive her to go as far as she did. I agree. I think one of the things about her being a fugitive is the fact that we can only rely on previous statements that she's made and some of the actions that she's taken, like the anti-American video. But I would like to hear from her more on like what her thought process was and exactly why she felt safe to go to Iran. I feel like there's more to that story. And I also want to bring up Hashimi and the fact that she seems to have a hand in recruiting her, but I didn't see anywhere where she was punished for that. And I do find it really suspicious that She got all this information from Monica, sent it over to Iran, and then was able to claim that she didn't have a hand in recruiting her. The facts in her story just doesn't line up with each other. Monica is considered a defector. Let's dive into defection and the reasons why someone would betray their home country. One thing we wanted to know is that defection is not the same thing as desertion. Desertion is defined as leaving a military post without using the proper channels. Defection is the changing of allegiance with the original side seeing the switch as illegitimate and when in the context of defecting to a foreign nation, harmful to the national security interests of the person's home country. The physical act of defection is usually in a manner which violates the laws of the nation or political entity from which the person is seeking to depart. By contrast, mere changes in citizenship or working with allied militia usually do not violate any laws. There are three main ways a person may defect. First, an individual may want to leave their service at once, perhaps from high-level disgust or low-level risk of having been discovered in financial irregularities and just ahead of arrest. Even so, the defector certainly brings knowledge with them and may be able to bring documents or other materials. So a person starts at country A and leaves and goes to country B. This is what Monica Witt did. Another method is to directly recruit an intelligence officer or terrorist organization member from within the ranks of the adversary service or group and having them maintain their normal duties while spying on their parent service or organization. This is also referred to as recruiting a quote-unquote agent or defector in place. So this person would start in A, they stay working in A, but are reporting to B. And a special case of a mole is a false flag recruitment of a penetrator. So they would start in C, they would believe they are being recruited by A and actually is being recruited by B and sending false information to C. There are many reasons why someone chooses to become a defector, and these include financial gain, change in agreement with policies, and religious motivations. Jenny, what are your thoughts on defection and the reasons why people would defect? I can understand why people would defect. I think in some cases, it can be a brave thing to do. I know a few years ago, the video of the North Korean soldier escaping and defecting to South Korea went viral. So that would definitely, in my opinion, that would be brave to do because he was literally being chased down and shot at. But I also understand how it is a betrayal or at least seen as a betrayal to your home country or whatever your leaving from especially in monica's case when you're sharing information that's wrong and in the cases of putting people's life at risk so we definitely don't agree with that 
I do understand, though, if you think what you're doing is wrong, you're losing your sense of self or that you're in danger, maybe defecting is right for you. I'm not saying it's like not a controversial thing. I think it's a lot of gray area and a lot of case by case basis because you could be defecting from one, you know, authoritarian government and going somewhere that is more democratic, uh, ruled by democracy. And I understand that. I think it's a lot of gray area and it's a very case by case basis because there are so many different motivations and so many ins and outs of military, government, religion, finances, all of that. So maybe that's a non-answer, but that's my answer. What do you think? I agree with you. It's such a gray area. And there are many reasons why someone would choose to leave their home country and basically defect to another one. Like the example you gave of leaving North Korea to go to South Korea or any other country, where you're leaving a totalitarian state in order to go to one that is freer. So that makes a lot of sense. But like you said, when it involves you giving information to the new country or using your previous access to harm people that still work for your home country, that's when I think that it crosses a line and that it's wrong. Obviously, people have the freedom to move, change uh, citizenship and all that. But once you get into espionage and treason, I think that you should definitely go to jail. And I think that if you still have citizenship, it should be taken away. So you're not able to use the privileges of the home country to basically harm its national security interests. So Monica is not the only person to ever defect from their home country. We're going to look at two examples of other defectors. The first is Benedict Arnold, and in perhaps the most famous case of defection, Benedict Arnold defected during the American Revolutionary War. He fought with distinction for the American Continental Army and rose to the rank of Major General before defecting to the British side of the conflict in 1780. That General George Washington had given him his fullest trust and had placed him in command of West Point in New York. Arnold was planning to surrender the fort there to British forces, but the plot was discovered in September 1780, whereupon he fled to the British lines. In the later part of the conflict, Arnold was commissioned as a brigadier general in the British Army and placed in command of the American Legion. He held the British Army in battle against the soldiers whom he had once commanded. Arnold repeatedly claimed that he was being passed over for promotion by the Continental Congress and that other officers were given credit for some of his accomplishments. Some among those in his military and political circles charged him with corruption and other bad tactics. After formal inquiries, he was usually acquitted, but Congress investigated his finances and determined that he was indebted to Congress and that he had borrowed money heavily to maintain a lavish lifestyle. Arnold mingled with Loyalist sympathizers in Philadelphia and married into a Loyalist family when he wedded Peggy Shippen. She was a close friend of British Major John Andre and kept in contact with him when he became head of the British espionage system in New York. Many historians see her as having facilitated Arnold's plans to switch sides. He opened secret negotiations with her friend Andre and she relayed their messages to each other. The British promised £20,000 for the capture of West Point and the major American strongholds. His name has become synonymous with treason and betrayal in the United States now. The other defector is Kem Philby. He was recruited by Soviet intelligence in 1934. After leaving Cambridge, Philby worked as a journalist covering the Spanish Civil War and the Battle of France. In 1940, he began working for the United Kingdom's Secret Intelligence Service, SIS or MI6. In 1949, Philby was appointed first secretary to the British Embassy in Washington and served as chief British liaison with American intelligence agencies. During his career as an intelligence officer, he passed large amounts of intelligence to the Soviet Union, including a plot to subvert the communist regime of Albania. 
Philby was suspected of tipping off two other spies under suspicion of Soviet espionage. Donald McClan and Guy Berksy, both of whom subsequently fled to Moscow in May of 1951. Philby resigned from MI6 in July 1951. He was publicly exonerated in 1955, after which he resumed his career as a journalist and a spy for SIS in Beirut, Lebanon. In 1963, he was revealed to be a member of the Cambridge Five, a spy ring which had devolved British secrets to the Soviets during World War II and in the early stages of the Cold War. Of the five, Philby is believed to have been the most successful in providing secret information to the Soviets. Jenny, what are your thoughts on these two cases of defection? Uh, Like we said a few times, Benedict Arnold, everybody learns about him in history classes here in the United States. To me, I think he's pretty petty, but I would also be annoyed if people truly were getting credit for my work and I was getting passed over for promotion. So I'm not saying what he did was right, but I understand him getting pissed off and saying, well, I'll, I'll show you guys. And he did remain like a loyalist the rest of his life. Kim Philby, I had never heard of. But it's interesting to see how his career, where it started and where it ended, and all the stuff that he accomplished in that time. Definitely Cold War, World War II, Spanish Civil War, all that. He was like really in it for the long haul. It's pretty interesting how, I guess, how long he got away with this stuff. What do you think? I agree. It's always amazing to me when it's decades of someone spying and getting away with it. Especially since at a certain point he was exonerated. So it's like, why did you exonerate him? Why was it that it took about eight, nine years between when he was exonerated and when he was revealed to be a part of aspiring. I also think that a lot of it reminds me of like movies, like spy movies, James Bond, where you have this double agent that's pretending to work with one side, but actually works for the Soviet Union. Benedict Arnold is an interesting case because like you said, it's pretty petty. The reason why he defected and I also think he wasn't really good at it as well. Like his main thing was to help the British win. And because he failed at turning over West Point to the British, essentially, he wasn't able to do that. But like you said, yeah, if you saw someone taking credit for your work, you're constantly getting passed over and you're having financial difficulties, I can definitely see why you would want to switch sides. Not saying it was okay, but it does have some logical reasoning to that. Mm -hmm. That wraps up this week's case. Thank you for listening. Let us know in the comments what you think about Monica Whip. You can read more about this case and how to support us in the links below. We will be back next week with an episode focused on Nicholas Barclay. As always, stay safe.